we'll start in few minutes. Uh, just to brief, what is the aim, why this talks have been put together? So Dr. Nirmal, who's our chief instructor, is around this building and finding the door to enter. So he is a principal assessor for NABH. He's one of the senior persons as far as quality goes. And he's also a chief architect of iCare standard, which you see along with the IUS. So when we look at quality in India, which unfortunately becomes uh, through NABH purview, because that's one agency which everyone looks at, though there are others like you can you know, get accredited with other parties also. So one of the things what we see is sometimes when our practice is there, we lose touch with emergency part. Because of cell per se is a very safe branch. We don't see lots of emergency. And emergency for us means eye emergencies. So we don't look beyond you know, perforated corneas and tears and you know, laceration foreign bodies. So that is one thing where during NABH assessment, you may not have eye department as a standalone practice. You may be part of a general practice, you may be in a medical college, you may be in a big hospital. So whenever we are looking at eye, and even if you look at uh, the COVID pandemic, the ophthalmology also became part of uh, you know emergency services because of lots of nuclear cases and other ophthalmic manifestations. So the purpose here would be to you know bring some focus back and kind of bring some areas out where we can probably face a problem in terms of emergency or we require a little bit focus on those areas for our NABH accreditation. So that's the topic which we are going to touch upon to just really bring out that, okay, these things, if we are ignoring, probably do matter to us for these reasons. And uh, another uh, thing would be uh, the ophthalmic standards. So whenever, you know, if you are going in for NABH and you are in this hall, uh, all practices will differ in size and will differ in the kind of work which is being done. So there is no way you can equate a 30, 40, 50 day, uh, you know, patients per day practice with some practice which has got 2,000, 3,000 patients per day and could be more. So the standards are universal and its applicability will automatically change based on the scope which that organization has. So let's say if it's a small hospital and there is no cardiac surgery, then obviously we are not talking about cardiac surgery, right? So there is nothing to worry on that. The standards, the applicability of standard as per your hospital is what is to be taken into account, okay? So when we talk in terms of emergency, the first point I would highlight is you can actually for us divide it into two, general emergencies and ophthalmic emergencies. So ophthalmic emergencies probably you'll know even more than me, so no matter. But that's the way if you think that okay, ophthalmic emergencies which we see most of the time, this is how we are going to handle and non-ophthalmic emergencies, how you want to go about to just have the basic things in place which are required and that will be what we are trying to bring about in certain examples that how that can help. And other thing would be in case you are in a set up where you get polytraumas or you know you manage co-manage cases other specialty then obviously these emergencies come so if you are in a place where your ophthalmic center is taking 24 hour emergencies then other things will come and in fact in bigger ophthalmic hospitals you may have a patient of polytrauma coming to you first whereas he needs neurosurgery first so there's always that thing that you need to evaluate and you need to know how to handle and those trauma patients when they come you really can't say no trauma is trauma accident is accident emergency is emergency the first aid or first thing can be done and we'll just bring out some legal judgment also to emphasize that fact that legally we cannot say that I cannot give first aid or I cannot handle emergency because I'm an ophthalmologist. So that thing has been laid to rest, whether we like it or not, like so many things which are pushed down our throat, this is another thing. As per law, we are bound to whether we like it or not. So our talks are in that order and this is a brief introduction to just give a gist. And Dr. Nimal will join us uh, in another five minutes, I believe. Can you put on my presentation, Dr. Gagan? Just one thing. Huh. No, this is not the presentation. No. no. Okay. So we'll go with presentation number two first. Right. So. I have introduced, oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Gagan, I work in Narayan Netralia, Bangalore. I'm also a principal assessor. I'm an orbit oculoplasty oncology surgeon. So barely do that work. So kind of deal with more emergencies than some other specialists, at least cataracts. So the only disclaimer is I am an assessor with NABH and the views in this talk are mine, not of NABH. Uh, can you shift the slides, please? Next. So NABH, if you see, uh, has got a fixed structure in all the standards. Like any book of NABH when you will pick, it has got 10 chapters and all those chapters have same name. So AAC is the first chapter all across. So there'll be 10 chapters. First five chapters are so-called clinical chapter, patient-centric chapters, last five are 
organization centric management centric chapters so i'll just pick across certain areas where emergency comes into ophthalmic standards to draw your attention there and then based on your practice you can delve deeper and do so in ac1 the standard number 1 which is there if you see it says that organization has an emergency department with easy access okay you will not find the same line in the current book but in the description it will be there then you should have some documented policies and uh, you know procedures how you are going to handle emergency service okay then you should have a registration and discharge process and then you should have something called a transfer process so i'll come on to all this and just tell you what it means so if you look at any hospital anywhere in the world the emergency department is well marked it's in the you know entry and you know directly you enter any big hospital straight away it leads to emergency the ambulance goes there and person goes down and you have a big emergency department with 10 12 patients every college every hospital everywhere you'll find the same so same thing is that with emergency the in and out should be easy so you want emergency to be approachable so idly speaking if you have two entrance three entrance in the hospital it could be any one of them so there should be if it's a big hospital adequate signage and access to emergency should be from the main gate so let me portray a thing that if you have a three story building you know first story opd second opd third opd or something so you can't have emergency department on third floor your entry is from first floor your emergency department is somewhere on first floor so that it's easily accessible and whatever emergency room or department or whatever you are showing as per your practice should be accessible easily means a stretcher should be able to go wheelchair should be able to go ambulance should be able to access so patient comes from ambulance on stretcher should be able to go in and should be able to go out right and a similar thing before someone says the size matter if you look at all imaging centers they also plan a same way you send any patient to a smallest mri ct center they will have a way to take that patient inside and get out on a wheelchair and a stretcher right so mark your emergency it should be easy there patient should come in case it doesn't matches you should be also able to move out or if you have any emergency of your own you shift to that emergency area and move out in ofsal you may not have a dedicated emergency area because we don't deal with so many but you can still earmark that emergency area and also you know use it for certain other purpose but yes in practice there should be some dedicated area in case a patient has problem patient should be able to lie down there you should be able to you know give oxygen give drips or whatever is required to manage that patient so documentation uh, in nabh you have to have a registration process patient comes you register you check something so same thing in emergency you'll have a process put down on a sheet of paper that if a emergency patient is going to come the security or first person is going to guide that patient to emergency room in emergency room this is a person going to attend at bare minimum we are going to check vitals we are going to take history and all those things just make a couple of steps what needs to be done for an emergency patient so that's our thing what we do we document that these things are required to be checked as per our requirement and here again i would do it in two ways i would put general emergency separate and ophthalmic emergency separate because doing them together is very difficult so i would clearly say emergency coming i will separate ophthalmic general and then go according to that so in some case you will have an emergency patient and you need to transfer that patient now it's your own patient develops some complication you need to transfer to another hospital some patient has come to you but rather than ophthalmic requires something else so in that case for both ways in emergency and otherwise also you have to have a process that how are you going to transfer a patient which is your ambulance which hospital you are going to transfer obviously that's one of the tie up when a patient can go to another hospital so how that is going to happen you will have to have a transfer form what details you are going to give along with that so all those things you have to document which will be required for both emergency and non emergency patients and uh, unstable patient here also represents some emergency or patient requiring more than ophthalmic care in your setup so you are operating patient had an issue i believe you would have got that example every city you or your colleague or someone would have faced some kind of an emergency during surgery so take that into an example and see what you did in that case verbally that should be in paper and we should all know those steps the reason of putting it on paper is when emergency happens everyone uses their brain and brain fade can also happen so you will be thinking something else you think the third person so no matter who is on duty no matter which nurse which staff is there everyone speaks the same language everyone follows the same steps so it's really really helpful and uh, then another aspect would be reassessment so how this will matter in an emergency is that i have a patient i am on call and i have admitted a patient okay patient has a small lid laceration came to class the other emergency i think but the main problem is there is a vitreous hemorrhage there is retinal problem there is some tear something else now retina needs to handle so i need to hand over the patient from plasty to retina okay or if the patient is under me like let's say i have admitted some uh, cellulitis patient something then i need to reassess patient so we always say no morning round evening round so that morning round evening round is nothing but reassessment of patient so when we say morning round evening round it is assumed that we are reevaluating patient at every 10 to 12 hours so same for emergency patient you reassess a patient if patient has come to emergency department is there 
and now you plan to do corneal laceration. Patient is sitting there, so someone has to check on that. So formulate a policy on that. You may also need to have some lab services if it's a very big hospital. So basic lab services may be required at night in case you are getting a patient and you are also planning to operate on those emergency patients. Right, and uh, this one is there. I'll come next to this uh, initial assessment for emergency patient. So what will happen is, I discussed earlier also, every patient you need to have some initial assessment. You know, emergency patient is going to take history, you are going to check for BP, vitals, what kind of injury it is, and then you know you are going to triage and all this will come further. So that process is your initial assessment and you have to formulate how it's going to do. And normally it's good to have a standardized process to an extent so that it helps and other things follow on that. And nursing assessment also is a part of uh, this one initial assessment. In some cases, if you are admitting emergency patient, they will also require nursing assessment, which again has to be done by the nursing staff. This is only for overnight stays, like daycare, it will not be required. So other thing is, who is going to perform initial assessment? So this is a question to you. If a patient is coming to hospital, or if you go to any hospital, who is the person who should be attending to an emergency patient? On duty? Doctor. So let me put doctor. So during assessment, many a places, if it's, uh, you know, some practice, the doctors are not attending. That's a fact. So there'll be, you know, sometimes ortho is attending, sometimes there's a nurse who's first or something. But anyways, an emergency room can be manned by a nurse or a doctor because they are trained for that legally. So even a nurse can be the first responder and the doctor can be the second responder. So first responder for emergency usually will be a doctor or a trained nurse. Okay, optomes unfortunately are not clinically trained and our technical staff is not trained. That becomes a problem someday. Okay, and then you have to have a time frame that how fast we are going to attend to a patient. Five minutes, 10 minutes and you have to monitor that. How much time over? You just had a brief, okay. So along with initial assessment, you, when you are having that emergency room which I showed you, you will also have to look at documentation. You need to have an emergency register separate. So emergency registers can be separate from your main. Maintain that. MLC if required, even if you haven't had MLC in last 10 years, you never know when you get. So the process of registering an MLC should be known to you and things which are required to do so should be available with you. And monitor all these things, whether they are actually happening or not. Then again, we have discussed qualified individual part, so we can move next. Now again, we talked about patient being transferred from one department to other one shift to another, someone told we'll have a duty doctor, so duty will end sometime. So whenever that happens, the patient has to pass on to the next team. So that is what we mean by sharing the information and handing over the patient to next department or next team about what we have done, what we are finding, and what is expected and what is the issue. So that thing has to be done. And so other thing there would be that as per act, uh, clinical abstinence act and various judgments, we need to still have a process for setting up an emergency department, we cannot refuse a first, you know, aid or the first examination to any other emergency. So we can't say it's only pure ophthalmic. So bare minimum, those basic things can be there. Once you attend to a patient, we can always transfer the patient saying that it is not in our scope or we are not equipped to do that. But that initial assessment or initial thing has to be done. That's what it is. How you handle is up to us. So that will be your first thing that, okay, you attend and then the transfer thing kicks in if that's what the scope is. So you should also know what are MLCs and uh, when to do an MLC. Uh, it doesn't mean that if patient says, I don't want MLC, and doctor says, I don't want MLC, it can't be MLC. You can treat a patient, everything done. After one or two years, you will get a notice from court also telling to give all documents, or otherwise it can be earlier also. Okay. And uh, other thing, triage. So once you get patient, we discussed ophthalmic emergency, non-ophthalmic emergency. Next step is triage. So typically three, what requires the immediate attention, urgent or something not. Like so let me take a very simple example. Acute conjunctivitis coming at night, seen by the duty doctor, what do we do? Very simple, patient goes off and you advise follow up probably five days, seven days, whatever is your protocol. But whereas if that patient is something of an infection thing, you will probably see early. If that patient requires some surgery, you will be probably planning for an emergency surgery. So that is a kind of a triage based on that. So you'll have categories mentioned that in emergency, these are the category chemical burn or trauma or laceration perforations. These are urgent, corneal surgery, these are semi-urgent or you know, something like that. So categorized into your triage and accordingly you will manage. And that can be documented and put up in the emergency room for everyone to know. So ambulance again is required. Most of us will have an MOU with an ambulance provider. We don't have our ambulances, but wherever an ambulance is there, the criteria remains same. So if and if you have outsourced, we need to have certain ambulance things. So if you have a good provider, all these things will be there where ambulance checks and things are maintained. 
and quickly, this is another part of emergency. If you have a patient where patients are even in daycare and you are having 50, 100 patients in hospital, you will need to, you know, give them some kind of an access system that they can contact you in case of emergency. Ophthalmic manpower, that way, therefore, of 50 patients, there'll be only two, three people manning the ward. So we can have certain system where patient can actually tell you or have a call points or panic points when they can inform if they are having any problem. And uh, other important thing is CPR, code blue, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. For NABH, that is mandatory. So all your staff has to be trained on that. You have to train up for that. And then, you know, basically you'll have to form a code blue team. We call it code blue. It's a universal term. And in that code blue team, you'll have your documentation. You'll have to have mock drills. And that is to be done on a periodic basis. And for doing this, you will also have to maintain your emergency crash cart or emergency trolley and the equipment which is required for CPR, at least basic life support. Okay. And uh, if you are doing any procedures on this emergency patient, you also need to have a proper consent. The concept of patient came in emergency and patient is consented for whatever we need to do does not apply. So no matter what, even if it's an emergency patient, the consent needs to be taken and it has to be an informed proper consent if you really don't want to have problems, at least in bigger cities where everything is going for a problem. A normal routine patient is going to <laughs> having uh, some issue. Okay. So medicine, again, there's an MOM chapter in NBH which deals with the management of medication. So same thing we discussed, we should have a crash cart. Same thing, we have to define our emergency drug list. We have to define what quantity we are going to maintain, how it is going to be maintained, keep a check on that, and how we are going to store. So the biggest thing is if you stored, like for us it was happening, that emergency room is accessible. Whenever someone needs something, the injection is picked from emergency room, then they will replace it from ward or something. So those things doesn't matter. If they don't replace it when you actually want, it's not there. So, you know, make sure that everyone knows that thing and we keep a check on that. It's not that emergency room when we actually need things, nothing is working. So please keep a check on that, not only for external patients coming in, for our own patients, which we are treating. And then again, for these patients also, you will have certain standard where we will see that how you, well you are informing families of these patients, what information we are giving, costing, what intervention has to be done. So after a while, once you are attending an emergency patient, virtually we have to treat them like a normal patient and have all those consents and other things being done for them. So if you are having a separate emergency, so this part will be done in emergency area because then that ward or that room is separate. So that's why this will be separate standard. If it's a common hospital, common ward, then everything becomes common after a while. So this will be the last. Uh, in HIC section, if you go, which is hospital infection control, it defines your hospital into different areas. So under HIC, your emergency will become a single area. So all the HIC practices for your emergency area have to be put in as a separate practice. So your OT will become separate area, ward will become separate. So simply put, your infection control practices in OT are not same as ward. Right, ward is basic clinic, OT is much else. So same thing you'll have to you know, plan how it is going to be done. And uh, that is another thing which you'll have to plan for that. Thank you, that's a brief overview. Certain things which you would like to elaborate, we can take in question answer session. And uh, Dr. Nirmal has joined us. So we'll uh, proceed with his first talk now, that is introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm extremely sorry that uh, you know, got the taste of Mumbai's traffic on the Friday morning. And uh, thank my team for uh, 
taking up the initiative and starting the uh, session on time. So thank you all of you for joining us this morning. So after a long time, we are having a physical conference in this uh, wonderful convention center. And this is my uh, uh, disclaimer. I'm with NABH as a honorary uh, principal assessor. Right. As you all know, most of our eye centers are under equipped, unprepared for the surprises and uh, not really having ambulance or transfer arrangement what Gagan mentioned uh, in his presentation and inadequate team strength. So even though medical emergencies are rare events that occur in uh, eye centers, but if encountered, these events require immediate diagnosis and management to avoid potential consequences. Mainly, we have to be prepared to save a life. And most important is do not panic. The patients and ad attenders will be in a panic state. So we have to be prepared to encounter medical emergency at our clinic. And this is part of patient care. So it's not only ophthalmic or uh, so now it is glorified compartmentalized uh, specialization care in most of our medical setups. But this uh, emergency care is the most important aspect of patient care. So why should we learn these things an important benefit CPR can give you is the ability to save lives during that golden hour and what do we get out of this we get uh, so we these situations create a hero out of you because this is beyond the call of duty it can save yourself and your practice and it can empower your team and for the hospital having a certified uh, BLS staff or team is very important because they are confident attending to medical emergencies. The transfer process takes less time and reduce incidence of medical legal challenges, which we are all worried about. Even yesterday, there was a court case uh, <coughs> with compensation of over 1.25 crores on the physician because of negligence. So this, when you are prepared, you can have a happy team and happy patients. So this is the crux of this instruction course. Uh, I should have started with introduction and uh, followed with, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Atik Sheikh, who will be talking to us about how to assess a patient plan for daycare surgery in the eye centers. Dr. Jayanthan will be talking about the equipment and training required for emergencies and code blue drill. And Dr. Gagan has already spoken on NABS standards on acute care emergencies. And uh, Dr. Kumaran will be talking to us about some case st studies and videos, how he managed uh, emergency in his eye center. And finally, if you are not prepared or some eventual uh, <coughs> things happen, we have to manage the situation and the crisis. So that is important, managing the public, press, and police during emergency and medical legal crisis. So that is the uh, last uh, talk. So. When you are encountering uh, emergency patient, not only ophthalmic emergency, we are well prepared, but if it's a general emergency, most of us are not well prepared. So we need certain <coughs> preparatory mindset for that. So we need to assess the patient immediately. And most of us are well trained in the undergraduate and CRRI time for this. But after we come to ophthalmology, we <coughs> lack continuity. So we have to know what are the equipments that would be useful during emergencies. How should we take a decision? This is very, very important. Decision making of transfer and uh, uh, <coughs> shifting the patients. And how to communicate the bad news with the patient attender. Because we'll have a, either a group or a big group of patients uh, attenders who will be waiting to hear from us. So first and most important thing is how to sense and save a sinking patient in the OPD. Right, so most of us are on daycare centers. We don't know the patients very well. Some of our review patients we would know, but we have to train our team to understand this. So I start with a few stories. This is a 35 year old lady who came for an incision curatage uh, for a calcium. It's a small procedure, OP procedure. We are used to doing that. 
and uh, so as part of the regular protocol injection xylokine test dose was given and story 2 is about uh, Mrs. X who reported to the reception for a, with a scheduled appointment she was seated in the waiting hall the OP got delayed as that happens in many of our centers so after uh, 20 or 25 minutes of waiting she is restless said I am not well how to see the doctor so what the usual response is we will let you in please wait madam right so she was made to wait politely by the receptionist and this uh, third story is a, on a busy Saturday OPD a 50 year old gentleman waiting in the OPD for a regular follow up visit suddenly became agitated starts verbal abuse of this staff started sweating profusely have tremors so what do you do in this situation and this fourth usually most of us are familiar with 89 year old male posted for cataract surgery very anxious patients and the BP has gone up to 180 110 all types of local anesthesia given topical intraocular peribulbar all those things still the patient is restless so these are four situations we generally come across and how do we tackle this so back to the first patient this patient uh, started itching and suffocating after the injection so injection test dose was given and uh, so on assessment these are the vital signs 124 per uh, minute 35 respiratory rate and the oxygen saturation was coming down and BP was falling down so patient was awake oriented the breathing was fast tired hoarseness of voice so generally flushing noted so what do you think of this yes so these are some of the hints to the diagnosis the sudden acute onset secondary trigger trigger here the trigger was the injection xylocaine test dose sense of impending doom most of our patients who have this problem still uh, tells this and the change in the voice so they can't speak so they have this uh, rapid change in the consciousness level so anaphylaxis as we all know is a potentially fatal we have to be on our toes it's a multi-organ system reaction as ophthalmologists we are uh, not oriented to this but we have to <coughs> immediately diagnose this and start therapy because once you start treatment is the most gratifying treatment for a doctor so is there any time for investigation what investigation you will do no so this is a clinical diagnosis so this is where our clinical experience comes into the picture investigations are not helpful in fact it will delay the care process in the acute setting so how do we recognize it's not always easy to recognize but you have to be hearing these kind of stories history of recent episode of anaphylaxis sudden onset the suddenness of following the injection it can happen after few hours also usually affect more than one system so test dose most of us we do give but we have to understand the minimum dosage not only test dose but also the minimum dosage for local anesthesia if you are giving locks only lignocaine 7 ml is the highest limit other than the more than that you will e experience pressure on the orbit and if you are using a combination of xylocaine with adrenaline don't give more than 17 ml and uh, if you are using bupivacin don't give more than 20 ml because uh, two uh, important things there is no standard guidelines regarding usage of local anesthesia test dose and the allergy can happen to the drug as well as to the preservative so most of this bupivacin will have preservative and also there will be cross reaction so just because uh, you have cross uh, allergy with xylocaine people tend to use bupivacin so cross reaction is possible in these group of drugs you have to be aware of this so initial steps in the management of anaphylaxis you have to focus on this a b c so airway management is very very important so you have to this is a key inter uh, initial intervention so you have airway tubing you have to start using that and also have injection adrenaline and injection hydrocortisone I will given and supplementary care oxygen cardiac monitoring IV access position the patient comfortably all these things your staff have to be really trained well so Dr. Jayanthan will be talking about it then if you have the facility you can have uh, treat the patient there itself or so in the simultaneously you have to transfer the patient call for the ambulance so back to our second patient so patient was present with classical symptoms of cardiac arrest sweating chest discomfort upper body discomfort nausea lightedness so what happened so we called code blue what uh, dr gagan was telling so code blue is one condition where we secretly silently convey to our team 
that there is a medical emergency, cardiac emergency. So the, during this time, our staff recollected their training and activated code blue, the receptionist called. So all the training uh, situations came into the real time situation. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation was done and uh, patient was non-responsive, no breathing, no neck pulses. They started uh, CPR. So this is, uh, we, we call it running the code blue. And uh, after uh, initiating uh, CPR, patient was transferred to an airway hospital. Luckily, we had a hospital uh, in, the, uh, in our street itself. Patient was admitted in the ICU. So the third patient who was in the, uh, on a Saturday ABC OPD, suddenly falls to the ground with hands on his head and sweating after the verbal uh, interaction with our staff. So then, so is it an emergency? Again, we have to do all these things. So quickly do a blood sugar. Since the patient was known to us, we know he was a diabetic. We did the blood sugar CBG. It was 62 milligrams. So what do we do now? So it's very important that we recognize and manage. So the simple treatment here is, so this is the blood glucose level and this is very, very important. Uh, around 120 you can manage with simple oral solutions. If the patient is conscious and uh, can't take oral fluids, so it's always better to give dextrose or any uh, <coughs> sugar-based uh, solutions. So even tea, coffee, whatever is available, that's okay. But if it's below 80, you need immediate <coughs> uh, hypoglycemia have to be reverted because the patient can go in for altered mental status uh, immediately along with the, and then you can also go for hypoglycemic crisis if the patient has already taken insulin or any uh, <coughs> anti-diabetic drugs. If the patient is not able to eat, you have to secure the IV line, start pushing dextrose 50%, IV bolus, and then monitor the blood glucose every 30 minutes. Most of this hypoglycemia, if you have a good well-trained team, you can manage if the staff is uh, well-trained and oriented to identifying hypoglycemia, this can be managed. So most of us, so uh, we are confident about managing hypoglycemia after about two or three episodes in our hospitals. So this is the fourth uh, situation which is quite familiar in most of our uh, daycare surgery centers. We have an anesthesi anesthesiologist all the time for any type of surgery. So the patient anesthetist noted that the patient is not uh, settling down and in fact uh, with so much anxiety the BP is going up. So he uh, gave IV metasolome, sedated the patient, the BP came down to 130-90. We continued with the surgery and this is called as monitor third anesthesia care or MAC which is really useful in many of our under equipped centers. So debriefing uh, medical emergencies can happen anytime, any day in any center. So how are our patients now? This is what happened to the first patient. Patient settled in uh, four to six hours time from the anxiety as well as from the anaphylaxis. The BP got settled, patient was happy, was discharged on the same day and uh, the attendants was really very happy that we managed the situation well. The patient, the second patient who suffered a cardiac event, recovered in the ICU, treated medically, and now he's on my lifestyle modification as well as cardiac care. He's doing pretty well, and uh, also happy to give so much uh, good comments and also refer his friends. So these are events that can really give you not only save lives, but also happy patient, and our team is extremely happy that all this uh, training didn't go waste. So common emergency in daycare center, hypoglycemia, anaphylaxis, particularly during FFA, the drug is a potent uh, source. The asthma exacerbation can happen because of the suffocation in the OPDs or closed uh, settings. Most of our rooms are dark, uh, small rooms. So this can exacerbate asthma as well as claustrophobia. Seizure attacks can happen impaired consciousness or pain shock. Even an injection can give pain shock. And of course, cardiac arrest because most of the time we are dealing with elderly patients. So there are many ways of being sick and defining critical illness. This is not the time and place to define illness, but how do we prepare our center and our staff? This is very, very, very important. So in the reception, we need to have some intelligent reception. And uh, when they inquire, <coughs> the patient have to, the staff have to understand from the patient perspective check the vitals. So if you have a triage staff, that will be very good to check the vitals. 
<coughs> and also we need to have a CCTV to see what is happening in the reception and train the staff to ab uh, identify abnormal vital signs. If they are deranged, they have to immediately call the doctors or the trained nursing staff. So these are some of the normal vital signs. We have to teach our staff that. So even the non-medical uh, staff like uh, optometrists or the technicians, the receptionists, we have to teach them. So overall in emergency situations, so there are red flags. We have to identify the red flags. Initial assessment have to be uh, imp uh, important, documented and has to be done as soon as possible. And intervention have to be as early as possible. Diagnostics can wait. So you have to reassess, communicate with the other team members as well as with the patient attenders and keep on helping the patients. So this is the overview of what you do in the emergency phase and non-emergency phase. Once there is an outbreak or a case, you have to follow these norms and also document all these things as, a, as Gagan said. You have to document it and see what is, uh, what is lacking in the emergency crisis uh, management of our center and see whether it could be in improved and all this have to be documented. So nothing can replace the skill, abilities and knowledge that is uh, uh, spent in preparing the team for the teamwork. And these are some of the reviews that it can really help. And so patients are very conscious about this, what you, uh, emergency situation or centers, uh, facilities you have in your center. So they, they are not uh, uh, seeing only the infrastructure, the aesthetic point, but they also see the preparedness of the staff uh, in managing emergencies like this and they do give this such wonderful feedback. So care starts at the doorstep. Vitals are very important. Know your patient. If it is an old patient, try to understand and know your patients during the registration itself. Equip well and train the staff. Knowledge, skill and teamwork is very, very important in managing this crisis. So problems do happen, but they are not stop signs. They are guidelines if you take it appropriately. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I request uh, Dr. Atik to uh, talk to us about the preparatory aspect. What you think? So before I think uh, starts, if there are any questions. Uh, so we can take one or two questions in between the talks. Otherwise, we have ample time during the uh, end of the session. So we can take the questions. Ready? Thank you, Nirmal, sir, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, my talk will actually be a continuation of what uh, Nirmal, sir, had uh, spoken. How to assess a patient planned for OP or daycare surgery? Well. The goals for a good pre-surgery evaluation starts with having a rapport with the patient. Most of the medical legal issues or the problems that we face are not actually because of the complications that we've had. It's mainly because of the language or the patient not getting, in, uh, getting a rapport with either us or our counselor. That is where problem happens, verbal exchanges happens and we get into trouble. So once a rapport is created with the patient, as well as with the family or the attender, the game is half won. So allaying anxiety is very important. This helps them to reduce the morbidity of surgery. It helps to reduce surgical delays and case cancellation. This is one of the most important factors for successful daycare surgery. And of course, in today's world, safeguarding us is very, very important. So who is fit for daycare surgery? By the ASA uh, classification, any patient who comes under grade 1 or 2. Grade 1 includes a normal healthy patient and grade 2 is a patient with mild systemic disease. They can be comfortably taken, for, taken up for daycare surgery. Age, however, is not a defining factor, but in general, a patient more than 80 years of age has a slightly more risk of developing complications. But in today's world, we cannot ignore even a 50-year patient who looks fit to us. Certain basic evaluation is always a must. Next, coming to body mass index, BMI of, left, of less than 40 
can be considered safe as long as comorbids are controlled. A patient with approximately 50 BMI is a relatively risky area and certain concerns has to be taken and we need to have good surgical backup in case we face any terminal events. BMI between 40 to 50, those include, they include patients in a relatively gray zone and they should be considered on a case to case basis. A good preoperative evaluation involves a proper history taking from the patient, general and systemic evaluation, lab experts, lab evaluation, expert opinion and most importantly consent has to be taken. So this is something which most of us were interested in, however now again we are going back to pre-COVID time, if in case we have another wave we should look at it. For a patient I think most of us or all of us would have had one shot of COVID at least. So uh, a patient who has had a mild COVID and recovered without much re non-respiratory complications or symptoms, we can take up that patient four weeks in case they are asymptomatic, six weeks for a patient who has become symptomatic but did not require hospitalization, recovered at home, eight to ten weeks for a patient who has been symptomatic, diabetic, immunocompromised or has undergone hospitalization, twelve weeks for a patient who has been sick admitted in ICU and had intensive care treatment. With regards to history, history explaining the current symptoms has to be taken. Most of our patients if you notice will be having some comorbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, seizure disorder or CVA, thyroid disorders, these things has to be taken. Well, I came up with this fancy term with one of my anesthetist friends. She said that you need to ask for effort tolerance. I asked what is effort tolerance? She said very simple. Doing your routine work without much difficulty or you can make the patient climb a stair of, uh, cl climb a fleet of stairs and see if they are comfortable. So that is what they mean by effort tolerance. If that is done, it gives a rough idea that the patient is reasonably fit. Medication history again is very important. Most of our patients again will be on either one of these drugs. Blood thinners is something most patients above 60, 65 take inhalers, steroid usage and anxiolytic. When to start or stop a blood thinner? I feel this decision has to be led to the physician or the cardiologist who started the drug to decide. But in general, if a patient is on warfarin or on clopidogrel, it is advisable to stop for minimum 5 days. It does not make sense starting, stopping it 1 or 2 days prior because the drug works for 5 days. So if it is not stopped for 5 days, stop the day before, it is as good as not stopping at all. If a patient is on aspirin and the patient is having some high risk CVA incidence, it is better not to stop. When to restart or resume the drugs? If we are expecting low risk of bleeding, it can be resumed even the next day. When we are anticipating high risk of bleeding, wait for 2 to 3 days. Maybe an orbital surgery or a DCR is done, it is ideal to wait for 2 to 3 days time. General examination, we should assess the general condition of the patient, look for hydration status, orientation, pallor, cyanosis, clubbing and pedal edema. Systemic evaluation, a thorough evaluation has to be done. CVS, RS, abdomen and CNS evaluation has to be done. Lab investigations, I feel in today's world it is mandate to do certain basic tests before we take up a patient for surgery. Hemoglobin is mandate. Why is it mandate? In case a patient develops some complication, that time our anesthetists or the hospital where we shift the patient ask, first thing they will ask is what was the hemoglobin of the patient. If we are clueless, then treating the patient becomes very difficult. A total and differential count helps us to come to a conclusion whether the patient has any active infection at present. Blood sugar level again is very important. High blood sugar levels should be controlled and then the patient should be taken up. Why urea and creatinine? Most of us do give NSAIDs post surgery. In case it is other than cataract, maybe again orbital or any other surgery, lot of NSAIDs are used. In fact, steroids also are used. So we need to know the urea and creatinine level before taking up the patient. ECG gives a rough idea about the heart's working condition. Chest x-ray, uh, we have been doing, uh, at least I have been, do I was doing during the first and uh, second wave a digital x-ray because some patients were not willing for a CT scan. If patients were willing, we were doing, but at least a chest x-ray has to be done. Now again we are going back to pre-COVID time. 
echo of course for patients who are at risk coagulation profile is a must in case we are anticipating high blood loss serology again for our safety well how expensive are these tests this is much cheaper than the biometry for most patients if you see the total cost of these basic tests will hardly come to around 1500 to 2000 rupees if we exclude the profit margin and tell a lab guy to come and take he may charge us maximum 1000 to 1200 i feel this is honestly worth it for our peace of mind expert opinion if needed should be taken from specialists a cardiac opinion if the patient is having any effort tolerance issues or, or, or a pulmonologist opinion endocrine opinion for patients with high thyroid i had an incident very recently had a special child child was around the mental age was around 15 the child was around 25 to 30 years of age uh, posted for uh, cataract surgery physician saw the child did echo all investigations then i told her she was a post tubiotic cataract so we wanted to give steroids then the physician said sir we have to do a thyroid profile i had no idea why she is asking me to do thyroid for a patient i want i want to give steroids and uh, 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 luckily the patient was having uh, hyperthyroidism so that was brought under control we postponed the case for about 2 weeks steroids were started and then treated because they said in fact it was news to me the anesthetist said that they may be having a steroid storm if you give more steroids on table we give a ga they can go in for shock so that was a learning curve for me this happened hardly I mean, we operated hardly one week or 10 days back it was incident which happened last time this was a learning which happened very recently consent is something very very important gagan sir and nirmal sir were consistently saying consent is very important how consent has to be taken one consent paper for the surgery and anesthesia is no longer valid it's absolutely void and it's history separate consent form has to be there one from the an one anesthetic consent and one surgical consent in the regional language this is something that we do in our center we make the physician see the patient and there is a easy tick for them to check what is needed what to be done and a signature is put that this helps us to have a documentation this is something that we do for all of our patients getting a patient to assess our patient and to getting a clearance for surgery is very vital it is a myth that the patient will run away if we make this patient spend another 3 or 500 or 1000 rupees more to see a physician if we make the patient understand that it is for their benefit and we don't get anything out of it most patients in today's world will be willing to meet a physician and get it done maybe if we don't have a high volume practice maybe one or twice a week cataract patients or the patients can be pulled up physician can be told to come they can assess the patient and give a clearance counseling plays a big role in patient satisfaction as i said earlier the first point was creating a rapport that is something that is very very important once patient feels comfortable they will be willing for most ethical tests that we do it is always safer to be a king in ophthalmology and live life king size rather than to be a jack in anesthesiology or in cardiology mess up our patient and then get into trouble so let's stick to what we know best the common myth or at least even i was under that feeling if we send a patient to anesthetist or to cardiologist they either postponed or they cancel the case well of course that is happening for, i mean that is for our benefit and one more thing that we found was sometime the physician has to be clear what surgery or what we are planning to do this is what we want this is what is the surgical time this is what is needed once that clarity is given it makes things easier for them also to give just like that patient going and saying i want a fitness for surgery then a lot of other investigations are done and patient and the uh, patient also goes through quite a lot of trouble so let's stick to what to know what we know best anesthetists and physicians are our saviors not only for us they are saviors for our patients also thank you i'd like to thank aos partha sir and nirmal sir for this wonderful opportunity Thank you, Ati. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, thanks for that uh, clue to become a <coughs> king in ophthalmic uh, practice. It is indeed important that we have the uh, team. And our team includes anesthetists. So most of us are hesitant to call anesthetists for a, a local anesthesia case. And it is our work. But um, in such emergencies, condi conditions, and in the stressful theater uh, days, 
having anesthetics really relieves your uh, takes care of your blood pressure during the crisis situation that is more important so living king size that is different but definitely the anesthetics in the room gives a lot of confidence to us as well as for elderly surgeons like me it gives a lot of confidence that they can tackle and control my blood pressure also and second thing they are very very good companions even before the patient can uh, start giving trouble they can identify and help us so just one dose of metasolum really helps these patients and now i become very fond of this monitored anesthesia care the patients are really happy at the end of the day the end of the surgery after even 5 to 10 minutes they walk back and they are very happy that their anxiety and pain has been taken care of as physicians very very important that we take care of the pain aspect we have a pain uh, scoring done in our uh, center is anton ready let me know when you are ready so we have we are doing a pain scoring in our center as well as uh, another thing called patient reported outcome measures how comfortable the patient was during our topical anesthesia or peribulbar anesthesia even though we are very very confident about our surgery in under topical patient because of their anxiety they do experience pain so we also did a matching study between one eye where topical was given and one eye where topical with metasolum or, or short anesthesia was given patients are really happy with short anesthesia so if you have vip patients where you are also anxious it's always better to have anesthetist and also ask them to give a monitored anesthesia care the surgery goes on smoothly and the patients and the surgeons are very happy so the next topic is uh, code blue as well as what equipments and training is needed to tackle medical emergencies as a team and also very confident in tackling the code blue situation so dr jayanthan saundaram bandin from new road will be talking to us he is a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist and refractive surgeon from ksi hospital and alayam lasik laser over to you jayanthan thank you sir i'd like to thank nirmal sir for this wonderful opportunity it a pleasant morning to everyone uh, so we are going to see about the equipments and training for the code blue session Uh, code blue means that someone is experiencing a life threatening emergency may it be a cardiac or respiratory arrest in your close vicinity so the main idea of this presentation is that in case of an emergency the role and the activities of the doctor and the whole team member should be planned documented and display the staff member should be adequately trained and updated in the first aid cpr and other emergency procedures the best emergency office kit is one that has been prepared and maintained by the doctor based on their own need and easily accessible for the immediate use the knowledge man knowledge of management of these medical emergencies will surely increase the confidence of the eye surgeons in their clinical practice right let's see how to go about first of all create an infrastructure for provision of emergency care to your own patient both in terms of the equipment that is required and the training that is required for the manpower train manpowers then gather the information about the latest guidelines about cpr document the code blue protocol in your clinic with everyone's role being detailed finally practice the way your clinic is going to deal with the immediate delivery of the bls and of course next the transfer of these patient to a higher center as soon as possible the key components of bls starts with the recognition and then next comes the cpr sequence starting with the compression airway and finally if nothing works out the defibrillation right okay so all that you need is a perfectly equipped crash cart okay let's see what a crash cart works as a multi drawer it's a multi drawer wheel cabinet with essential medication and tools that are required in case of an emergency situation it's also called an emergency cart emergency response cart code cart or an emergency relay whatever you call it the content is all that matters the purpose of a crash cart is to provide immediate access to supplies and medication whenever there is a code blue it facilitate coordination of the emergency emergency equipments all at a point it saves valuable time at the time of emergency so a crash cart will vary from hospital to hospital depending on the individual facility requirement and of course the patient population so it has to be different for a population where you deal with more of pediatric population rather than a elderly So the best practice is to keep your supplies that are frequently used together in a same drawer and separate your drawers based on the function we'll see that in a short while make sure each drawer is clearly labeled on the outside 
right? The crash cart contents could be either the external or the internal contents. The external contents are the oxygen supply, defibrillator, monitor, suction apparatus, stethoscopes, uh, of course, the crash cart checklist and the drug information sheet. The internal are going to be the drawer contents, right? So keep the bigger things outside and accessible. Literally, the bigger things are often the equipment you may be utilizing first in case of a code blue. It starts with the portable defibrillator. An automatic external defibrillator is a very handy equipment which can be even used by a non-professional person. All that you need to do is activate your AED, apply the patch. These AEDs will analyze the heart rhythm and whenever prompted by the voice command, just pressure the shock. That's what you are going to do. Uh, so this is actually required whenever the patient's heart needs to be rhythm back to normal. So in case if you don't have an AAD, all you need to do get is a manual defibrillator. But the issue with defibrillator is you need to know the indication when to use it. So basically a defibrillation is indicated only in certain types of cardiac dysrhythmias, specifically a ventricular fibrillation and a pulseless ventricular tachycardia. If the heart has completely stopped, as in cases of an asystole or a pulseless electrical activity, defibrillation is not indicated. Right. The next one is a portable suction machine. So it allows to clear the airway quickly and prepare for possible intubation and other advanced airway placement. Suctioning can actually prevent a pulmonary aspiration. Right. So once the airway is patterned, you can crank open your oxygen tank and deliver oxygen by the appropriate means. So the oxygen supply starts with an oxygen cylinder uh, supported by the cylinder key mounted on a trolley attached to your pressure gauge, pressure reducing valve, flow meter and an outlet to the connect to the oxygen tubing. The second component of the cardioplane resuscitation is artificial ventilation. So we'll see the masks that are used in CPR. It starts as a pocket mask or a CPR mask. It's, it's used to safely deliver the rescue breath during a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest. If you're used to the mouth to mouth breathing, so in that position you can use these masks. This is a one way protection valve that allows the gas to pass from the rescuer to the patient without any physical contact between the two. So you can, uh, once you use a mask, you can use, uh, you can give the rescue breath using a mouth to mouth breathing or you can use a bag valve mask resuscitator. A bag valve resuscitator or an abu bag or a manual resuscitator is basically a handheld device commonly used to provide positive pressure ventilation to patients who are not breathing or not breathing adequately. So it aids in administration of the high flow oxygen, pro provision of the positive end respiratory pressure, provision of controlled ventilation and of course provision of for the augmentation of spontaneous ventilation whatever is present at that particular time. So once you have a good oxygen uh, tank so the idea is to deliver these oxygen as per the patient's requirement. There are various equipments that are available. Uh, the first one is oxygen nasal cannula. It comes as a high flow and a low flow. It has a uh, twin pronged cannula which can actually deliver oxygen directly to the patient. Uh, the second one is a simple oxygen mask, the Hudson's mask, which is rarely used now because of the uh, I mean wastage of oxygen. The most commonly used is a venturi mask. As you see here, it comes in different colors. These are the valves and each valve represent a, uh, the amount of oxygen that would be delivered. So according to the need of the patient, it can start right from two liter per minute to a 40 liter per minute. Right, the next are the drawer content. Keep your drawers stocked according to the function. There are certain general guidelines how you can stock. It's all absolutely your choice. So first of all, it would be the medications. Uh, the most commonly used medications should be stocked in the first and easily accessible draw. You can get the help of your physician or your an anesthetist and uh, during a uh, code blue trial, the most important drugs has to be listed and uh, stocked accordingly. Like an amiodarone, atropine sulfate, lidocaine, epinephrine, dopamine, uh, all these essential has to be there. The second would be the IV solutions. So the, uh, like uh, what Nirmal sir was telling, during a hypoglycemia, dextrose has to be handy. So these are very commonly encountered in our practice. So you need to actually have at least the basic uh, IV solutions ready. The third one would be the adult intubation. Right? Whenever there is a respiratory arrest, the intubation has to be done. So it has to be stocked. Even if you are not dealing with the pediatric, it is always better to have few of these resuscitation intubation equipments for pediatric population as well. Uh, the next one would be the IV and the blood draw samples and uh, the tubings has to be kept in the next draw. And finally, uh, the procedure trays and miscellaneous can be kept at the last draw. So as I said, like pediatric resuscitation can be planned if you are uh, having a pediatric population. Even if you don't cater to your pediatric population, you may have an attender walking in and having an issue. So all it is always better to have your resuscitation kit ready. right? 
So as I was mentioning, it is always better. It is not the car per se. It's a content that is very important. So you can buy any of these crash cards which is available nearby and then customize according to your needs. So as I said, like here, the medications are kept in a drop track racks, not in the drawer. So you can buy any of these crash cards and then uh, you can assemble it, right? Uh, more than assembling it, the most important is knowing where your supplies are located on your crash cart is as important as having everything necessary. So navigating your way through your hectic code is much easier when you have an organized system for your crash cart. It's, it's good to have a mind map, but it is always safer to have a printed map of your cart. So the content has to be printed exactly so that anyone can just see and then go for the content e easily. And maintaining an inventory of your supply as well as inspecting them is a very crucial element. Mind you, you don't want to be in an emergency and find that your cart is missing an appropriate size endotracheal tube or that you don't want to see that your epinephrine is expired, right? So a crash cart is uh, good content, but uh, it'll be actually uh, difficult to carry over. So in case where you want, like in your reception, you can have a miniature version of your crash cart, which is going to be the adult crash box. Uh, just like the cart, you need to actually stock your equipment and then uh, label it at the top. So it will be easy to carry. You can keep it even in every floor of your hospital. Coming to the training part, why is a BLS training important for healthcare professional? The main reason is it will increase your confidence. You will be ready to respond to your emergencies. And most of all, it speeds the recovery of your patients. Right? The BLS, the basic life support, is intended to be for everyone who needs to know the basic principle of CPR, AED usage, and other primary methods of life-saving skills. It includes everybody in your hospital, right from the security person. Uh, advanced cardiac life support is designed specifically for the healthcare professional. This, is, this includes the physician, nurses, anesthetists, paramedics, dentists, and all. Okay, so the, now the decision is, are you going to learn and teach yourself or are you going to seek the external agency's help in training? You can get, uh, gonna go either way, but uh, the idea is to get trained properly and then keep doing it in, as a mock trials. Okay, if you want to go for an excellent agency, you can seek help from anyone. Uh, even the American Heart Association has got uh, tie-ups with your local people. Wherever you are in India, you can actually have a tie-up to hospital of a AHA. AHA runs an online uh, BLS training also. You can get an online uh, BLS training. You can have uh, complete your online BLS training and then go for the institutes. Every medical college in your vicinity will definitely have a BLS training. So once you are trained, you can give training to your own staff or you can invite the faculties and then do it in your. So the idea is to get a good training and then keep doing it. So get a BLS mannequin for your own hospital and then keep practicing it every once in a while. Uh, these emergencies happen rarely, so it is always better to have the necessary algorithms. It could be either the recommendations from institutes like an AHA or you can actually write it down and you can have your own uh, protocols which has been prepared by your anesthetist or your physician. You can have it laminated, pasted everywhere so that once it happens, you can actually use it when the code blue has been announced. So to conclude, acquire the knowledge, develop an attitude to act in time, practice until these skills become automatic for you, retain your skills by doing mock drills once in a while, develop and retain good relationship with police people, fire service, ambulance, referral hospital, anesthetist, and most of all, your own staff because they are going to help you in your code blue trial and most of all they have to stay with you after getting trained if you lose this patient you, you lose your staff you are going to train the next person again so it is always better to develop a good relation with your own staff thank you thank you Thank you, Dr. Jayanthan. That was a wonderful conclusion on acquiring the knowledge and developing the right attitude for the uh, practice. Uh, since uh, Dr. Kumaran couldn't join us, uh, you have recorded his uh, video. Let me play the video for you on uh, case studies in emergency situation and how he managed in his uh, hospital.
boxes unless you face one. So this particular talk here, I'm going to highlight a process which was really life-saving and changing my career. So this is a code blue situation. We as ophthalmologists never have faced a lot of code blue situations in our practice. So these things could be new to us. If a code blue situation is going to be new to us, just imagine the plight of a staff. Hence, I'm going to take you through a particular incident which happened in my center in, way back in 2017. We were into six months into our certification. Just to take you an overview, this was a patient which happened uh, in, in the December 12, 2017. It was a 64-year-old lady who was posted for a second eye surgery after the first eye was uneventful. She was shifted into the operation theater after initial assessment. All her vitals were normal. And after she was changed into her OT gown, she wanted to go to the restroom. She came out, she went to the restroom, and to uh, the surprise of all of us, she just fell down and became breathless in front of her attender. Remember, all this happened when I was into my uh, operation. I was doing the fourth case of the particular day. So I actually, I did not know what had happened. So she was immediately shifted to the theater and the code blue was activated. And I, and I could hear the siren of the code blue uh, going on in the, in the background. So what really went wrong with the patient? We have operated on her for the first time. Everything was normal. That, but what went wrong? We were really didn't know what to do. So we did a retrospective analysis going back to see what really had happened with this a patient previously. So, so this was a particular patient who presented to us around uh, four or five days back. Sorry. Yeah. So this was a patient who presented to an OPD one day. She had actually come from a nearby town, which was located around, uh, say, 100 kilometers from place. Her son was living... Uh, separately. So we did take a normal history. She was a diabetic and a hypertensive. Everything was normal. We did all the preoperative investigations and we went ahead with the surgery. Surgery was uneventful and she was discharged immediately after one hour of observation. She presented to us after five days. Her visual improvement was quite good. So we went ahead and fixed the surgery for the other eye. Normally, we, we would not reassess in five days, so we went ahead with the investigation, was done later. So we did not know, we did not know what really went wrong with this uh, patient. What really hap has happened after the cold blue was activated? She was shifted into the operation theater, her auscultation showed reels and writing, her BP was sky high, and, and uh, the oxygen saturation was dropping. She was started on an IV line, injection lasix was given, nitroglycerin, and we have an MOU with the uh, nearby multi-speciality hospital, especially for situations like this. The BLS ambulation, uh, the ambulance arrived and she was shifted out immediately. And actually all this was happening in my background because I was operating on a particular case and I was occupied and I cannot leave the case and come out. So the theater uh, anesthetist wrote all the notes and I went and saw the patient after half an hour in the ICU in the nearby hospital. She was actually doing well. And I talked with her and then she, so I, I just uh, updated the, uh, the attenders on what was happening and I reassured her. But when I came back to my hospital and started my OPD, I got a call back from the ICU stating the patient's vital dropped and she had actually lost the patient. So she had an, uh, a large intraventricular aneurysm which had ruptured and we couldn't save the patient. So what really happened in this case? See, just imagine I started my practice in 2005. Those days we used to use or do only around 40, 50 cases in a year. And, then, and I never used to have an anesthetist standby or another doctor standby during my surgeries. Just imagine if this had happened long back, then I could have really been very, uh, I mean, it would have been a very bad situation. So I would say I was really lucky because I did not have any of these situations early days of my practice. So what really happened? So this was an obese patient we just took her words for granted that she was a diabetic uh, and a controlled hypertensive. We did do her investigations, but everything was normal. So we were a little bit uh, carried away with 
uh, with all these investigations. So all the investigations are normal. The first eye uh, surgery also went on well, which also took, uh, which also uh, gave us a sense of uh, confidence to go for the other right. And during the uh, uh, code blue situations, we had difficulty in deciding of the status asthmaticals or an acute MI. We had difficulty in finding an as intravenous line because you would know most of the cataract surgery, we do not uh, start the patient on an IV line. And this was the first situation where we had a code blue and there was panic all around. And I was occupied with another case, which I was not able to leave and get back to this, uh, uh, to this particular uh, code blue situation. And there was also difficulty in shifting an obese patient on a stretcher into the ICU and the ambulance. We did not have adequate staff to uh, face this kind of situations then. And the other major thing was that the CCTV camera did not function. Though we have a CCTV camera in all the lobbies, it did not function in this particular situation because we found out that recording in any code blue situation is very vital. We were saved by the fact that the entire code blue situation happened in front of the attender and he also knew what was really happening. Uh, so there was no deficiencies on our part. Then uh, we had difficulty in following the patient because I had to finish the, pay, uh, the surgery and go back into the ICU, the different hospital. So what are the points we learned from this code blue situation that you need to have, have a very high degree of suspicion in all these patients, never take their word by granted, look into all the medications, follow, follow all the protocols which lay in place, have an intravenous line for all your patients, however small or big they may be, because most of the high-risk case do not have a problem. The so-called non-high-risk case are the one which gives you a headache and which can go into a high-risk situation. And check all your emergency medications. We always check the, the ophthalmic medica uh, medications and the insulin during surgery. But our staff nearly tend not to uh, check all the non-ophthalmic situations like a boil, a boil's apparatus, the intubation tubes, the oxygen cylinders, all these things have to be checked before you start your theta. And have a, a staff separately assigned for this. The more important, follow a core team, form an emergency team with minimum six protocols, and do not forget to record everything that happens during the code blue. So finally, the take home message is that have a separate team, record all these uh, code blue situations. Please do have an anesthetist standby or at least another physician standby to record all these events so that you are able to do your surgeries with peace. So this is the take home message I would like to uh, tell all the young ophthalmologists you might not face an high risk situation or a code blue situation during your uh, surgeries all the time, but one situation is more than enough to spoil the peace of your mind and a career because you know how the media could pounce upon all these kinds of situations. So to have a peace of mind and, and more than that, to take care of your patient, you should have an SL standby and a code blue situations, a BLS training to all your staff. In fact, we have also changed our HR policy in such a way that whenever a person has a BLS training certificate, we give them more incentives in a, in a salary. So there are other common scenarios which we commonly come across in our practice is the hypoglycemia. This is a 50 year old gentleman who was waiting in the, in the OPD, falls uh, unconscious, becomes agitated and what do you do? Check your ABCs, vitals, blood sugars, and always check the blood sugar before. So hypoglycemia is a common situation which we come across. In right. so, so thank you, Dr. Kumaran, for the wonderful video. Good morning. This was one case uh, which I was in the loop all the time, uh, helping him uh, as a emergency uh, lined up. And this is one situation we were able to diffuse the uh, crisis, even though the outcome was not good from the patient point of view. But from the patient point of view, the outcome was good. And now after five years, the patients attend the uh, family do come to the clinic for uh, their eye checkup. So it is a good outcome. But for the patient, yes, we lost the patient, but there is a lot of learning from the incident. So the entire idea of this uh, instruction course is to take you through uh, uh, area where we are not trained for, one, second, how to prepare for it, how to assess the patient, and how to have the uh, 
equipments as Dr. Jayanthan mentioned and what are the standards the accrediting agencies uh, expect from the eye care practitioners and eye care hospitals so which Dr. Gagan has uh, put up. So what happened and uh, Dr. Atik has really mentioned about the uh, assessment and having a company for your uh, practice. So what happens if all these things doesn't uh, go as planned and we are in a, a different situation so where there is a crisis so if there is a death or there is a <coughs> unfortunate outcome so we need all these societies to come and help us so how do we go about and what do we do so this is a golden hour situation in mi the first one hour is called as golden hour and in rta or road traffic accident the patient has to reach uh, the uh, <coughs> medical care facility within one hour and same way if there is attack or if there is a <coughs> unfortunate event in your hospital the first one hour is very very important how you shift the patient to another hospital how you uh, your team takes care of the people family attenders how you br uh <coughs> break the bad news to the family all these things are really important how we document so this is a pressure cooker kind of situation and uh, of course if the pressure cooker s situation goes out of hand we have to go and tackle these kind of the four p's the press police political sprinter groups and of the public so these are some of the important things that have uh, happened and the gone are the days when patient accepted as gods now the roles and uh, the le letters are reversed and so we have to deal with this non-medical issues as well in our practice so we are blamed for every disaster like the previous case where the incident was a medical the patient had an aneurysm so which is totally out of our hands and then we are blamed for every disaster so there is attack on staff hospital doctors and of course the image get dented permanently so how do we go about this so crisis in non ophthalmic emergency situation can be so many <coughs> can happen due to so many uh, situations it can be structure induced where there is no oxygen where there is no emergency uh, team or emergency <coughs> equipments it can be process induced the staff not doing their work properly or not transferring on time doctor induced uh, maybe non availability of doctor or anesthetist or uh, staff induced they give some wrong information to the patients or their attender can be drug induced like what happened in the xylocaine uh, anaphylaxis it can be self-inflicted or patient or family inflicted. So we have to deal with this diverse kind of non-ophthalmic emergency situation. So as an ophthalmologist, uh, so we should not take over and above our capacity. So you can't deal every situation, every uh, case. So you have to refer at the right time. This is the uh, message we want to give to sales. So you have to take as per your infrastructure, as per your training, as per your experience if it's not in your specialty please <coughs> be kind enough to refer the patients counseling and communication if you are tackling a <coughs> patient with comorbidities and multiple uh, em emergency situations or critical eye disease you have to convey the uh, information to the patients properly documented have proper communication and uh, consent and have a uh, maybe you can record the consent videographically as well as staff induce the staff not imp uh, complying with the instruction wrong site wrong route or, uh, wrong drug and rough handling of patient and relatives and wrong news or exaggeration or spilling the beans what happened uh, in the OT or in the block room so these are things that can happen so we have to train our staff to manage the situation and as I said, the complications of local anesthesia can happen due to various uh, issues. So having a, a medical person assess this as well as an anesthetist assess this and help us really helps. So life is not about how hard of a hit you can give. It's about how many you can take and still keep moving forward. If already uh, we are prepared for it, we can take some more and we can keep moving forward. So how do we face the crisis? and how do we prevent the crisis so in risk management or crisis management uh, prediction and early warning is important so you have to be prepared and also try to prevent so you have to be ready you have your people have to be responsive and we also need to be a bit resilient so all these things can happen in practice practice is not like 
the previous era. So we have to be prepared and we have to progress with all this in mind. And also you have to bridge the gap with the community. So how do we do this? These four P's are important in a crisis management, police, press, politicians and the public. So liaisoning with police, so you are running a community practice, so we have to be uh, working with the community at all levels, particularly the law enforcement authorities like police. So, th so this is one situation we came across as a uh, IMA office bearer, death in the hospital, the mob demands 304A and arrest of the doctor. So the local inspector was politically oriented, so he uh, uh, goes to the doctor's house, we got a call and uh, so four or five of us uh, gathered at the hospital and protested and called the D uh, DGP of police and ensured that the doctor was only given a memo and not arrested. So the issue was solved after that with the intervention of higher officials. Liaison with the press is also important, local police people, uh, press people, so if there is a on table death or if there is a uh, incidents in the OT, this can go out of our hands. So we have to work with the associations as well as the uh, local IMA. And uh, so instead of the doctor talking to the press, we took the initiative, the office bearers, and we talked to the press and explained that this can happen in a hospital setting, on table death or on table uh, incident or MI can happen in any situation. And the doctor has taken the, uh, or provided the patient care very well by shifting. Uh, the third important thing is the local people, the politicians or the local area. So there can be some splinter political group which is uh, uh, spearheading this movement. So we have to talk to them and diffuse the situation and uh, take the help of uh, the other people also. So public relations when you are running a practice is very, very important. If you are a small practice, you have to take the work yourself or if you are running a hospital, you can hire a PRO or appoint a person who is in charge of taking these three important piece when they come to our facilities. If the police come to our facility or the press people or the political people, so we have to take care of them because they have they will take care of them during this kind of emergency situation. So professional bonhomme is very important. So uh, we have often heard of professional uh, uh, jealousy and jostling. So always never talk ill about your professional colleagues in front of the patient. So even though the patient was not managed well, so you have to work in the, so do take care of this important aspect, join associations, collaborate and work together. So you may be practicing or it may be a professional uh, competitor, but once you join association and collaborate, so the work becomes easier and we can refer the patient to him, for him or her for support. Process and protocols are very, very important. These are important uh, standards which can prevent such attacks as well as crisis. We can also learn from post disasters. So this is what we learned uh, from Kumaran's incident. So post disaster, we have to document this and see where it went wrong and take a proper response, see how we can reconstruct things from then on and move on. So preparedness is very, very important. Prevention is all the more important. So need of the hour, apart from profession, be active like an entrepreneur, be an association member and leader. So again, the problems are not stop signs. They are guidelines for our future practice. So thank you so much for your kind attention. If there are any questions, we have some more time left. We can take uh, questions. Sir, actually there's a question uh, in my chat box. I think few of them are still in the webinar mode. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they asked what uh, will be done differently for a camp patient. Is it safe to operate them without attenders? when we should avoid operating without attenders. Okay, so the uh, wants to know about the consent for the camp, camp patients. patients. Uh, camp patients, because usually they bring them without attenders. Sir. Yeah. So the question is like, uh, is it safe to take them without attenders? And is there any condition where we need to, um, I mean like uh, not to take a patient? Okay. So. Uh, a uh, few important aspect in camp patients. So most of them come uh, with their family members or neighbors, right? So if the neighbor is there, we can get the uh, witness signature from them. Now obviously most of these patients are adult patients. They can give their consent for a local procedure. So the consent is not the issue. If something untoward happens to these patients, whom do we contact? So we have to take the uh, contact numbers beforehand, address, 
So this is where proper registration really helps or uh, taking a government ID proof helps. So this is for identification as well as conveying the uh, bad news to the patient's family. So uh, proper registration is important. Very often we see in camp situations, we just take the name and uh, take the patient immediately for surgery without properly assessing. Assessment is one important process, right? So, so very often we are focused only on ophthalmic assessment, preoperative assessment, but a diligent uh, general examination is also essential. At least the, like the AOS guidelines mention about blood sugar, uh, ECG, and blood pressure monitoring, and monitoring the vital signs during the surgery. So a good preoperative assessment and uh, intraoperative monitoring is also important. Okay, so what happens in Karnataka is you can maintain an emergency register and accident register, right? Certain cases are clear cut. Like for us, we get lots of these industrial patients, industrial trauma and also they are straight of MLC, even whatever they say. So situation where MLC has to be done, it has to be done. Then there is no discretion for you. But in other cases, like you are saying, you have just attended and referred. So you have to still maintain an accident register entry, which basically what Sir was highlighting, that in an accident register, you jot down the injuries, what you have seen, what were the findings, identification marks of the patient, what is the brief history, what accident happened, who has come with the patient, and most importantly, their contact details. So the information which we gather in an MLC, you need to gather that information and keep it. Don't inform the police. Have that information. In case it comes to you, you will have it. Right, the problem is, uh, what I feel is, most of the medical legal cases will come early. These RTA cases are having a problem. You're getting summoned after eight years, six years for compensation. And if you don't have a record, you cut a real problem. So the lag period is quite some much at courts. So no one will look at that, why we need to keep a record for eight years. But RTA cases, after six years, eight years, seven years, they are asking for documents and everything. And you would have just done a polytrauma eye examination. So they want a specific report, what was the eye part. And though the patient has been managed, the orthopedics and other things also. So wherever it is there, keep your record. In case it's required, it's there with you. If not required, then life is good. Now, there are guidelines for keeping the records. For inpatient records, you have to keep for six years. And after that, you can, <coughs> if it's a manual record, you can have a soft copy and continue to maintain it. So particularly MLC cases, whether inpatient or outpatients, uh, where you have a suspicion that this patient had a poor outcome. So these kind of cases, you have to ma maintain the document for some more time. Sir, the courts are condoning that period. That's yeah, there was a time limit, but unfortunately They are now condoning that, so that is what happened. So this case is actually after seven <laughs> years. So uh, that's a problem no, there. Th these are the guidelines given by the Director General. Yes, sir. Okay, but uh, the courts, uh, as usual, they're taking upper hands yes, and sir. revising all the statutes. So the lot of uh, judgments have come that you have to keep all these records for lifetime. We don't know whose lifetime, whether the patient's lifetime or our <laughs> lifetime. Yeah. No, uh, different okay. type means the basic insurance policy is the same, and when you are buying it through certain platforms, they offer you certain extra services. Is that what you are asking? No, in professional indemnity, so there is a professional indemnity uh, policy available with Oriental Insurance, and most of the uh, uh, the PSU companies offer that. So you have to take as per your age, as per your critical nature of the uh, practice. So if you are a surgeon, ideal to have at least one crore policy now. And of course, also have this uh, uh, PPLS scheme or something given by AOS or national IMA or your state IMA, at least for the, for the maximum. I think the maximum they give is for 20 lakhs. So they help us with the, if the you receive a court uh, <coughs> case or a notice, they help us with uh, giving a guide us with giving a uh, reply note to the notice or attending the summons. Whereas in the, uh, the insurance companies will not do that, will not give any medical legal support. 
So they will only, if there is a compensation, they will pay for as per their policy requirements. So it's always uh, prudent to take uh, this twin prevention, okay? Take maximum policy uh, or insurance indemnity with the PSU companies and also have insurance or some professional indemnity with the associations. Yeah, there are uh, legal com medical legal companies coming. The IML has come with one initiative. So there are uh, <coughs> companies available, support system is available, but they come with a cost. Yeah, so right. so right. the one thing, what his question is, the basic professional indemnity is a fixed cost. You can take it from any company. So when you are going through this platform, they give you the basic policy plus whatever their add-on features are. So it's like a car insurance. You can choose any number of riders and add-ons. So up to you and your comfort level. And probably I see lots of variation there region-wise because ultimately if you are having issues, they will start from your local court to your uh, state court and all. So whatever is happening in a particular state and particular city is actually a good practice to follow. So what is happening is Bangalore will not happen in Mumbai. Okay, yeah, last question. We have to wind up the session. We have an eye center where we all the facilities, but uh, we do not have the infrastructure outside. So like the uh, anesthetists, only two are available and they are in the government setup. So they're always busy in the government work. So I do not have access. So till now we've been uh, operating without, <laughs> without an anesthetist standby uh, and haven't faced such problems. But uh, do you think we should continue like this or like what, what would be the way to go? Right, so if you don't have uh, access to anesthetist or the trained manpower, so you have to train your own people. So that is where all this BLS training really helps. So BLS as well as advanced life support. So you have to train your core medical team with BLS and ALS, advanced life support uh, training, and also have infrastructure. So you can't have anesthetist all the time, right? So even in OP, this can happen. But you ensure that your people are trained and you always have a trained team available to support you. Yes, in oral form you can give, but uh, you have to do a proper assessment of the patient, preoperative assessment. See it can whether the drug can help him. If it's an elderly patient who is very anxious about surgery, you are justified. You are basically a physician, right? Uh, only then you have taken an extra course and become an ophthalmic surgeon. So you are well within your rights to give a anxiolytic. So if you feel that patient is very anxious, you can give. And so if like if the blood pressure is high on the day of the surgery, in spite of all the medication, uh, if it's like borderline high, can I treat the patient? Yes, definitely. Okay, uh, can I give the anxiolytic? Blood pressure you can treat, anxio uh, anxiety you can treat, at least for the initial level. So obviously beyond uh, your uh, control, you have to refer the patient or postpone the surgery, ask the physician to control the blood pressure and uh, the other comorbidities and then refer back to you. So don't hesitate to uh, postpone the surgery. There are people who hesitated and en uh, ended up with complications. Thank you, sir. Does manager do those features for every patient? No, there are no guidelines as such. It, it is a risk benefit uh, thing. You have to take a call based on the so if there is a previous history of reactions to any drug, you are justified in giving it. So it's only a documentation process. Right, thank you so much for your uh, kind attention and attending our course. I thank the speakers, Dr. Atik, Dr. Jayantan, and Dr. Gagan for joining us, as well as Dr. Kumaran. So thank you so much. Hope it was useful. So if you have uh, any feedback, please feel free to contact us. Thank you.